Our third speaker is Sally Sherwin. Sally is currently finishing up her PhD at the Animal Welfare Science Center at the University of Melbourne, Australia, studying the impact of visitors on zoo animal welfare. She also works in the wildlife conservation and science team at Zoo Victoria's conducting behavior and welfare research at each of the three uh, zoo properties. Dr. Sherwin. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. I um, came here to talk to you today about some of my PhD work, but also about some more recent grant work that we're, we're going to fo be focusing on. So Zoos Victoria, much like all other, well, a lot of other zoos around the world, are driven by conservation goals and a key tool in achieving these conservation goals is providing a connection between humans and animals. However, there's, there's very little science behind the impact of this connection, both in terms of visitor experience and attitudes after such an experience, but also in terms of animal welfare. So in response to this, Paul Hemsworth, who was my PhD supervisor, and, I, and David Fraser mentioned him for his work earlier today um, in human-animal relationships in livestock. We, um, we pulled together an Australian Research Council federal government grant application. And um, originally it was for my postdoc research, but it really turned bigger than Ben-Hur. And it's, it's now a massive three-year project. And I'll, I'll get into more detail about that soon. But I thought I'd just start with a bit of background that should help explain the direction we took with this this research grant. So when we think of the human dimension for animals in zoos, we can talk about familiar and unfamiliar humans that they're exposed to, a range of behaviors that visitors perform in zoos, um, the close proximity to humans, also the regular presence. So they're part of, uh, quite a consistent feature of the, of the animal's environment. David Fraser also stole this slide off me, but um, this is Paul Hemsworth and Graham Coleman's model of um, livestock and human interactions and it's largely based on the fear of humans so with the with the ultimate idea that reducing fear of humans will enhance animal welfare jeff hosey then applied this model to the zoo settings and um, separated it off into two sections the familiar humans so the keepers so they're similar to the the stock people and also the visitors so the unfamiliar humans he then characterized the relationship as potentially being either negative, neutral, or positive. So negative based on fear of humans, neutral based on potentially habituation uh, as a result of um, interactions with humans that are of no consequence to the animal, and then positive in, in terms of an interaction with a human being so rewarding in some way or stimulating. And there's um, evidence in the literature that um, supports all three of these categories of human-animal relationships. But we still lack a lot of science behind a lot of the species that we work with. So another challenge we also face in Australian zoos in particular, we're heading down the path where we're really trying to encourage connections between humans and animals. And this can tend to involve, involve uh, hands-on interactions. So if we take a look, there's no wonder there's some pretty cute looking Aussie animals out there that people just want to get their hands on. And koalas is a good example, actually. A lot of people come to Australian zoos and really want to hold a koala. And there's actually different legislation in different states according to what you can do with a koala. So in some of the northern parts, you can actually hold it, like Oprah's doing here. Whereas in other states, you, you just stand next to it and you pat it. That is based on absolutely no science at all. We don't know what the impact is on koalas. So this is the idea of this grant, to get some of that science behind these kind of interactions. So in terms of what we plan to do with, with the, research, um, the research program, we've pulled together a massive team. So two very big zoo organizations in Australia. It's Zoos Victoria and Taronga Conservation Society. So between us, we've got five zoo properties. And this involves um, zoo biologists like Vicky Melfi and also welfare scientists, so Paul Hemsworth, Graham Coleman, um, and Jeff Hosey as well. So all of the brains behind those human-animal relationship models. We've also got um, endocrinologists that help us with our physiological measures and um, psychologists, so Graham Coleman takes care of the, the human impact part. But today, obviously, I'm focus focusing on the animal welfare part. Um, <coughs> Physicists, you're probably thinking that's a typo or something, but it's, it's true. We've got physicists on our team, and that'll make sense a bit later. I'll touch on that. 
We also um, are, are targeting experimental work because we want to determine a cause and effect relationship between human interaction and animal welfare. So we pick a visitor variable and manipulate that and then assess the animal's responses in terms of behavioral and physiological measures. And where we can, we try and focus on negative measures but also positive measures. We're also considering the scale of interaction um, on, on a scale, from hands-off display type exhibits to um, all the way up to hands-on close encounters. We're at the very start of this, um, of this program, but what I'm going to present now is a few results from the first part of this scale, so the hands-off display exhibits. We did some exploratory work um, testing different visitor variables in those settings, and that is then used to inform what we do for the hands-on encounters. So I'll just really quickly run through these, but feel free to come up to me and ask about any more details for this. Macropods, we studied western greys and red kangaroos, and we were focusing on visitor number, high versus low. We found really strong species differences in general behaviour, but overall, neither species showed any significant changes in their behaviour or physiology in response to visitors. So we suggest that's a neutral relationship. Little penguins, on the other hand, we manipulated um, visitor presence, so we shut down the exhibit um, as part of the experiment over time, and we found really strong behavioural differences. We're still working on the physiology, but behavioural differences suggestive of avoidance of people when they were exposed to them. Um, so behaviours like increased distance and increased hiding behaviour. And then we found uh, more behaviours indicative of positive welfare, so play behaviours in the pool when there were no visitors there suggesting potentially negative relationship with visitors. Meerkats, we studied three different groups at different zoos and we manipulated visitor behaviour in terms of their intensity of interactions. And nothing at all three sites in any individual meerkat. Again, another example of a neutral relationship. Capuchins, we targeted visual contact and we used one-way vision screens. This is an example of what it looked like. So the capuchins saw a white screen, and the visitors could see through the mesh um, just with slightly obscured viewing. We sampled fecal cortisol and um, behaviours, and we found big differences in both. So almost 70% reduction in group aggression when they couldn't see the visitors, and also 40% reduction in um, self-mutilatory behaviour and also fecal cortisol levels. Again, a negative response. Reptiles, we, um, we were really interested in visitor-induced vibrations, so, you know, that banging on the window that um, there's a lot of anecdotal reports out there. So we, um, we manipulated this by throwing signs up and having zoo, uh, zoo staff present at the exhibits, and we logged it with vibration loggers stuck to the glass. And we found that when the signs were up, we found significantly lower vibration levels as logged by those loggers, and also noise levels in general and the reptiles adjusted their behaviour. When there was more of that visitor banging noise and noise levels, we found behaviours indicative of avoidance in terms of their position in enclosure and their orientation, but also more freezing behaviour. So there's an example of some of those exploratory studies in the display encounters. Our next step, we're looking at close encounters, so handling. And we've just started some, some projects on Lord Howe Island stick insects, so ever since David Attenborough came um, and visited us, everyone wants to hold one of these, but naturally there's a bit of, um, a bit of hesitation being a critically endangered species of, of insect, so we're getting some science behind it to see if there is a, an impact. We're looking at immune response. And with frogs, we're working on a protocol for sampling urine for court at the moment to look at the effect of handled versus non-handled frogs. Quokkas as well. So in terms of the future work, again, we're going to keep working on these close encounters and handling impacts, and the tool development phase is where the physicists come, come in. So we're trying to develop some accelerometers that are customised for the animals, and uh, actually they should be ready by the time I get back to Australia in, um, in a few days, so ready to be tested. The cool thing about them is they're Bluetooth connection, so we walk past with our phone and we can download the data and see what Wilbur the giant tortoise has been up to the previous 24 hours. That again can be turned into a positive visitor experience as well if they're interested in animal behaviour. But ultimately, this research is designed to get some science behind how we can make informed at human and animal interactions in zoos. Because at the end of the day, we all know that our conservation goals don't matter if we don't have high standards of animal welfare. So that's it for me. Just a shout out to all the partners on this project. And I look forward to updating you on future results. So that's it. <laughs>
Thank you, Sally. <laughs> Questions for Dr. Sherwin? Yeah. And, and I would assume most arboreal monkeys, we know that was, you know, clouded leopards or true chameleons. So how did you factor in those things? Because I would have, you would assume that versus I would test them. Yeah, yeah. So we, we assume that a lot of the enclosures, that the enclosure design is going to influence their response. So with those guys, it was, we're, we're only reporting results for that group. And it's, yeah, it's a, an enclosure that lends itself to a visitor effect, pretty much having the visitors up that high. Same with the penguins, visitors could hang over the edge of the pool. But, you know, it's about getting some science behind this to, to make the changes. So now the capuchins in that enclosure have permanent screens up. So zoo management also take notice of that, these kind of results. Gordon? Yeah, you know, mentioning the monkeys, uh, over 40 years ago, I think it was, Mitchell did a series of studies at zoos on uh, the presence of visitors and enhanced aggression uh, in monkeys of several different, uh, different species that were not arboreal, that were terrestrial. Mangabay, so I think there's a literature there I'm sure you're familiar with that goes back a long time, but only now I'm really pleased to see it being intensified and systematized. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the key thing we're trying to focus on is not relying on correlations and natural fluctuations in crowd size and things like that to assess differences. We're, we're trying to get some experimental work in there so we can determine cause and effect and also come up with practical applications for zoos. Okay, thank you.